Well, going back a long time ago, and I'm saying a long time ago, I'm talking back even as early as the 60s, okay? There was a lure that, of course, my father and his friends, it was called, a, it looked like a top of a beer can, called a Walker Special. And it had an unbelievable wobble, and it had a lot of action. And back in those days, there was a lot of baits that caught a lot of fish. But this was a novelty, and it worked. It just had tremendous vibration. And I always wanted to impart that vibration to another lure that had a bigger profile. Plus, it would not be prone to hang up, basically. You know, just be snag-resistant type lure. He's got the mindset he'll work on something and then he'll get frustrated a little bit and then he'll go to something else and then get, you know, but that was always in the back of his mind to be able to couple a jig with that type of vibration. And he literally has hundreds of different, of different models yep. of that type of action <laughs> coupled with what you can cast with something a jig dressing can be put behind. I guess I'm different than most fishermen in, a, in the way that when I go to the lake, bass fishing. There's not a bought lure on the end of my line, no matter what real it is. It's something I've created or altered to the point if I'm wherever I'm fishing, the fish hadn't seen that before from anybody but me. Some yeah. of the early, early versions of a chatterbait yep. had uh, the weight molded onto the blade, which the Walker Special had yep. the weight molded yeah. onto the blade. So it was initially just trying to attach a hook in some manner to that. But that was a big step forward to taking the weight <laughs> off the blade and putting an unweighted blade on a weighted jig head. But it took 15 years of R&D with just playing with it and putting it down to get to a state to where uh, the right configuration, the right hole placement, the right shape of the blade. And the right trailer. The right trailer, you know, all of that. It, it took a while. The initial design was a very narrow blade in the front. And I had the problem, of course, the blade slipping through the eyelet. So I naturally, I increased the width of the blade in the front and at that time, I recognized the fact that, hey, this thing's going to go a certain distance. It's going to stop and it's going to go back. And that created an incredible amount of vibration. You could actually feel it on your rod tip. Now, what, what year did you 98. Okay, he retired in 98, and he was able to put full, his full, full you know, efforts towards developing. I mean, it's, it's always been, a, you know, something that's been a... Um, a dream of his to get this thing perfected. I don't know what's in there and what's in there, but it's it's about being, you know, he's always wanted to perfect that type of lure. Right. But each prototype had some type of problem to me, and he was bouncing things off of me. It was either it, it had hung up too much or the vibration wasn't frequent enough, or if you reeled it fast enough, it would blow out, or it would come to the surface too quickly, or we couldn't get the right dressing on. But in 2002, there was something real close to what's there now he came up with and I said from what I'm doing fishing that's it we can do something with this it's unique there's nothing out like it there's some things that have tried to touch on it um, but it's this is something that we can fill a niche with never really had a vision of this being a commercially viable product uh, the only time that vision came to fruition was when I was in the boat with this young man right over here. Well, he, he was doing it to win tournaments. Yeah, I was. He didn't have the goal yeah. really to no. take it to market. Yeah. He just wanted an edge fishing tournament. I mean, we yeah. just fish small tournaments too. Yeah. We still enjoy doing that. So at that point in time, in 2003, all of our efforts were towards getting some patent protection on the bait, some trademark. Um, applications in and uh, also just trying to 
maximize its efficiency with how we can not only manufacture it but also the best possible action. Now he's a perfectionist <laughs> and and if it were still up to him it would never be marketable because nothing's ever good enough that's just the way he is and I'm not quite that way. Yeah, that's but, true. Um, he, uh, we finally agreed that in 2003 we would try to have it on the market by 2004. This is the original Chatterbait, the first one that we agreed on as being prototype right here. Three-eighths ounce, foil on the blade, white and chartreuse. Three-eighths ounce. <laughs> this guy here was a, I guess you call yourself a tennis pro, teaching pro, okay? He was at Gatewood Country Club in Greenwood teaching tennis to the ladies, making a nice salary. It was in wintertime, I believe. What year was that, Ron? 2000 what? 2003. 2003, he handed in his resignation, making a good salary with two young children to say, I'm going to make fishing lure. First show we attended was, I think, in Columbia, South Carolina, and we couldn't even get inside the building. We had to stay on the outside of the building. That was Sportsman's Expo. Yeah. You know, and wow. matter of fact, a guy that a lot of people around the fishing industry know, Mr. Robbie Byram, had Byram's Country Store up there on uh, Highway 160 going over to Fort Mill. He was the first to put them in his store. In 2004, we only sold 5,000 pieces, and most of those were at the shows. The very first big show we did was the Bassmaster Classic on Lake Wiley. some of your better fishermen that were, were willing to try something new. Most, a lot of you bass fishermen don't think there's nothing new. Some of those, some of those great fishermen, you can always put Brian Thrift right at the head of the class. There were also people like Roger Pope, Hank Cherry. I would deliver to those guys. Once this thing got that, the, the information got out, this thing's worth fishing with. I was actually making up baits by the box, sometimes 24 to a, a box, and hand delivering them to the Bass Pro Shop, me, Roger Pope, and Hank Cherry, the person to deliver those baits to them. And they didn't want anybody to know how they were catching fish, which you don't blame them. Well, the, the first time I was actually introduced to a chatterbait was when Ron was making them in his house at Greenwood, South Carolina. You know, they'd sold some to some shops up around where I'm at in North Carolina. And we were throwing them, you know, three or four years before they ever even made it out on the national tournament scene. So we'd been catching them around the house on it for a long time. Brian's trying to get a foothold in the career at the time. I mean, he, he is an <coughs> ever start trying to make his jump to FLW. But of course he wants to retain an edge too. So it's a very fine line. When I first started traveling and fishing, I fished as a co-angler on the Costa Series and I actually won a tournament on a chatterbait at Lake Eufaula. And the, the story behind that is that we were, went into the last day of the event and I'm the only guy in the tournament with a chatterbait other than, <clears throat> you know, my other buddies from North Carolina. So I draw a guy out and we go out in the first 30 minutes, I catch 20 pounds on a chatterbait. He's throwing a spinnerbait and hadn't caught a bass. So I give him a chatterbait, and he goes on to win the pro side. I win the co-angler side. And we kind of never really said anything about it. And, you know, Ron heard about it, and he's like, man, you, you got to talk about the chatterbaits. I basically called with hat in hand, begging, look, I know, and you're a good enough fisherman. I told him this, you, I, you know, I, you, you're going to make it regardless, but we need help. And that's about the time where the, the, to me, my opinion of how the whole retail market changed uh, with the lure industry in the early 2000s, with the age of the internet, when every tournament result was published. No longer were the fishing shows on Saturday morning the drivers of the market. It was how people were doing on Saturdays in their little local tournaments or the real big tournaments. That started driving the market in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I knew that it would take 
one big break. Um, and I knew that he had confidence in the lure, so and I knew he already had success with the lure. And he basically said, without hesitation, of course, I'll do everything I can for you. I'd caught some fish on a chatterbait in practice, and that's pretty much all I had going. I didn't realize how good it was. Like, the fish had never seen it before, and it was just unimaginable at the big fish I caught down there in the tournament. I mean, I caught like an eight or nine pounder every day, and two of the four days I caught two over eight. So it's just phenomenal bite, and nobody else had them. You know, I'm just I'm having my way with these fish with a chatterbait they've never seen before. And the first day of the event, I, Rob Newell interviews me, and he says, Brian, you're in whatever second or third place. You know, how'd you catch your fish? And and everybody, nobody wants to tell what they caught them on the first day. Well, I remember talking to Ron, and I, I remember my promise. You know, Ron, if I catch them on a chatterbait, I'm going to mention it. He put that on the internet. At that point, we were history. It really didn't matter because they couldn't get them that quick. It's, it was too hard to get baits back then, and so I had, was the only one throwing it in the tournament, and Ron calls me up and he's like, what's going on? Chatterbait sales are going crazy. And then I ended up winning the event on the chatterbait, and it just blew up from there. He did what he did. We picked up his entry fees for the remainder of his tournaments after that. So, you know, immediately I wanted to know we were serious about this, and we want you to be the face in your field for this product. We sold 25,000 lures in 2005, and I had geared up because wishful thinking that in 2006 we would sell 100,000 lures. And at that level, I could actually make a decent living, supplement his income, and we would be fine. Well, in 2006, in January, was when Brian won the Everstart, and the FLW followed two weeks later and five of the top ten were using chatterbaits. When the projection of a hundred thousand went to two million in two weeks, you had no no way out. The number one, even the money that it would take to make a million pieces, if it takes you a dollar to make one, how are you gonna make a million pieces? And that was the a stumbling block. I mean, I couldn't make more than what, even a hundred thousand. At that point yeah. in time, we had six employees. Yeah, he, he hired right. six people. When I was in Greenwood, he was still here doing what he could do, helping yeah. out with you know yeah. doing some heads and mm -hmm. uh, putting stickers on blades, things of that nature. But our capability was about five thousand a week at full capacity, and we had Brian Thrift that would come on his days off, Casey Ashley, Andy Montgomery. Yep, Andy. They would come when they you know, when they could to help assemble what they could just to help out. As soon as I talked to Thrift, he'd won the tournament. Uh, we tried to order as many as we could get, and of course Ron was, was not a large company, so he didn't have tons of chatterbaits. But uh, we got what we could and sold them, and I even had people coming in, buying them, and, and putting them on eBay and really making a lot of money on them. Um, I really didn't know that's what they were doing to begin with, but uh, it, it was just crazy. Got to a point that you couldn't get them. The prices were, they were getting on eBay were ridiculous for the baits. Well, for me, well, and my wife also, actually, my wife was one of the ones, Valerie, she was my customer service agent. Um, she, had bri she had bribes of several hundred dollars to get people's orders out. They would send her gifts. <laughs> um, and again, you know, I had total support from my entire family, from this family here, my parents and my sisters, to my, my, my wife and my children made a lot of huge sacrifices, which I'm extremely thankful for. But there was no limit to what these anglers would pay for a lure. And eBay had them for anywhere between 100 and 150 bucks a piece during that time period. But certain stores were trying to slip money in our back pocket to try to get their orders out quicker than the next store and I don't find that odd or weird but everything was moving so quickly everybody wanted to make their money from you know from it very quickly. Every bait that we got in we sold I mean as soon as soon as 
as soon as they came in the door, they were gone, and, and a bunch of people would come in and prepay for them, and they were sold before I even got them. Z-Man was uh, making our skirts for us, and also uh, we were in talks with them with help, helping us um, to do some of the labor for um, production, just the labor, in-house labor. We were already in talks with them on that. Z-Man's been around in one form or another for about 30 years. We started off as uh, simply a silicone skirt manufacturing company. We were actually an offshoot of another company that uh, they were in the automotive industry making silicone products and one of the guys that was on board that company at the time uh, was a bass fisherman and looked at the silicone tape and thought, hey, I can find a way to color this and slit this into strands and make skirts out of it. And that's how we got started. When Brian won the tournament on Okeechobee, all of that got thrown into fast motion, but it got to be more than what they could do as well, in-house, with the amount of employees that they had. So an employee that's still with Z-Man, John Wahop, came to Greenwood, we sat and met. And um, that's when discussions began as far as um, them helping out with their resources to pull us out of the hole and um, put, put their resources behind it and we could work off of a royalty deal. So that's when that all happened. But it all happened within a two-week time. But it took at least six months to get straightened out. We were building these baits. They were co-branded Z-Man and Rad Lures. Um, it was under a license agreement, which license agreements are pretty standard in the industry. Um, when you know an inventor has a bait, um, whether or not they have a patent, but they have a bait design, you know they essentially you know sell that idea to the company in exchange for a per unit royalty. That goes on all the time, um, and that's kind of how we. We, that was our relationship with the Davises from 2006 until 2008. It was such a simple concept. You know, I know a lot of people would probably say, well, why didn't I think of that? Well, it didn't happen overnight, obviously, as you've seen, but uh, it was such a simple and easy thing to do that allowed all your backyard tackle manufacturers well, they could put their own together very easily and not being knowledgeable about when there are patent app of patent implications as well as trademark as ray as well as trade dress the general public had no clue what type of infringement or what kind of consequences could come from that if they didn't it was just lack of knowledge. On the patent protection side and the intellectual property side, um, Ron Davis was very, very smart. Um, and part of that was due to his background outside the industry. But a lot of inventors, uh, especially fishing lure inventors that are, you know, might be tinkering in their garage, coming up with concepts on their own, not associated with a large company, don't really have the foresight, uh, the background, or the knowledge to take the right steps to protect their product. And, and that requires a pretty significant investment of time and money. If you go to the Bass Pro Shop, there are a category of lures. You've got crankbaits, you've got spinnerbaits, you've got jerkbaits. You got different categories of lures, and none of those lures are patented items because they've been done for so long. So it was very unique in a lure that came along that was a different way of making a bait wiggle. All the way going back to 2004, 2005, the right uh, papers were filed with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. The patent applications were filed then um, as the product was being brought onto the market. And that's what you have to do in order to protect an invention. You know, only the original inventor can file for that patent. Um, and you know, that's what, uh, that's what the Davises did, is they filed for that patent. It wasn't uh, granted immediately. It took us, what, five years? Mm -hmm. To secure a patent, and I'm going to say in excess of $100,000. The simplicity of the patent is what it is, and it's no secret to people that want to do the research. 
it's basically, it can be summed up in one sentence. It is a blade attached to a weighted hook in a manner where the oscillation of the blade is restricted. Now, we've expanded on that, but that's a pretty broad statement. There's a blade attached to a weighted hook. Single hole. With, yeah. with, a, with at least one hole that has restricted oscillation. And the oscillation can be restricted by either the eyelet or the head itself. Uh, I had a couple buddies that were using the Phoenix um, bladed jig vibrating jig so i bought some green pumpkin ones obviously green pumpkin on anything is my favorite color just because of the versatility and then i bought some you know some swim cinco's some lake fork magic shads and literally i was up in the north end of clear lake it's in the fall it's just solid grass um, and i was sitting there eating my lunch and i'm like you know what i'll tie on one of those phoenix vibrating jigs and i'm going to put this swim bait trailer on the back and uh, put green pumpkin with green pumpkin. Stood up, made a cast. First cast, I caught a five and a half pounder. And I was like, man, maybe there's something to this thing. Coming from Arizona, we don't have a lot of, we don't really have any grass lakes. So um, besides fishing the Delta and Clear Lake on the West Coast, we really didn't have much grass lake. So um, having went, went to Clear Lake and did well at the end of that 07 season, um, and kind of having a little little confidence in a, in a grass bait. And I know I'm going to Toho Kissimmee, which is, we all know, is solid uh, hydrilla milfoil. I mean, whatever kind of grass you want to want to go to or look for. Um, and literally, I, I took that bait that I did well at Clear Lake on, um, had it tied on, and that was my search bait. I mean, the biggest thing in Florida fishing is trying to, you know, there's always small areas that hold lots of fish. So um, it's really hard to like flip and cover enough water. So you got to have a really good search bait. Um, and obviously I, I went to, to Toho and I think I had the biggest winning margin uh, at that time. You know, to come, come from Toho drive like crazy, get to the Delta, which is one of my favorite places in the whole entire world to fish. Just having the confidence that I love the Delta so much and the confidence in that bait. Uh, obviously momentum's a big, big thing in any type of sport that you have. And it just rolled on and that's really what kind of kick-started my career to that next level. You know, it, it, it definitely kind of put my name towards that bait um, and it, it just kind of, you know, obviously it got it more popular. Well, at the time, um, we were um, in, a, in a tough spot. Things had gotten so uh, crazy with production. Um, I was moving farther away from the actual process of new product development. There were lots of offers. Lots of offers from different, but we found Z-Man to be the, um, had the best opportunity through them because they were not only local, um, but uh, they were already involved in the process. When you, if we were to jump to another entity that would slow the process down, you would have lags in sales, it'd get confusing with contracts that had already been done. It was just the, the best fit, and um, they, they put a very fair offer um, out there um, with bonus contingencies contingent upon, you know, different milestones with patents and intellectual property, which we were still in charge of, and um, it was something at the time we just felt like we couldn't, couldn't turn down. You know, it became clear, and I think it was mutual on both sides, that, um, that you know, long term, the best thing for the Chatterbait brand, um, and the best thing for the Davis is probably not to have to be involved day to day um, in all the, the headaches that go along with manufacturing and distributing and selling a product uh, for Z-Man to essentially acquire the Chatterbait portfolio. The brand name, um, at the time, there were patents that were pending that the Davises had filed for. Uh, there was the name Chatterbait was trademarked, and then uh, they had also were smart enough to um, register 
trade dress protection on the hexagon shaped blade. So in 2008, early in 2008, we essentially purchased that whole portfolio from the Davis's company, Rad Lures, and Chatterbait became a Z-Man product that was owned by Z-Man. The first patent didn't issue until 2009. So, you know, when we acquired the brand, that was kind of part of our calculus, is that we knew that these patent applications had been filed. Um, you know, it took a long time to prosecute that through all the way, all the way through all the different steps in the patent office. Um, so we knew that that was a possibility, uh, not necessarily even a likelihood at the time, but we knew that we may have that additional protection. And that was a big factor for us in making the acquisition, that we knew that we may be able to protect that invention. That made it even a more valuable asset for us. This was a certificate we got on a plaque, burnished on a plaque, of the original Chatterbait patent. Obviously, you see the name up there, James Ronald Davis, which is my dad. It only took five years and six figures to get it through, but we finally got it. I think a lot of people have learned what, uh, you know, what style or what quality of fish it catches and what a great tool it is at fishing. Not, not only aquatic vegetation, but it's really, really works good around docks, works good in rocks. It works good in every scenario um, that you would almost throw a, a spinnerbait or anything like that, but I think it's just a lot better, better bait than a spinnerbait anymore. To dethrone Greg Mohan and earn the title champion, you need eight pounds and five ounces. Something felt funny. I set the hook and um, I was thinking, man, I hope this isn't a tree limb. And I saw that it started, my line was coming towards me and then came up and wallered and, and it was, you know, almost eight pounder and um, really dug under the boat. That was the biggest fish I've caught all week. It, it obviously got a lot more exposure with bass um, because a lot, a lot of guys look at that and really uh, you guys got you got guys like Zona who's really breaks down the pattern and um, I think you know that that kind of obviously clues people in and now from from 14 to now I mean the chatterbait craze is on. I think that what the pros do on tour whether it's Bassmaster or FLW I think that's very important and really largely dictates uh, bait sales. Um, you know, of course, in 2006, Ryan Thrift's victory is what kicked this thing off. But if you go back two years uh, to 2014, when uh, Paul Mueller had the largest bag in Bassmaster Classic history, the largest single day bag, and finished second in the Classic, almost won the thing. And then Brett Height followed that up with two victories on the Chatterbait Elite. Um, we saw our sales skyrocket immediately after that. So it wasn't like the Chatterbait ever gone, went away or anything like that. It's just kind of a refresher uh, that brings it to the front of mind. So I think what the pros do, uh, what the pros are winning on, uh, is very important. And, you know, a lot of people that have been in the industry for a long time um, say, they've, they've told me, you know, you look at what wins the Bassmaster Classic at the beginning of the year, and that's what's gonna be the hot the rest of the year. I think that probably used to be the case more so than now, but it just kind of illustrates the point of you know how important tournament success is uh, to bait sales. I think that's a lot more true with baits than it is with rods or reels or electronics. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, let's say uh, eight years ago, you know, I would say in the Elite Series or FLW Tour, maybe 10% of the guys had a, a bladed jig tied on. Um, and then now I would say, uh, I, I mean, I would say at least 90% of the guys have a bladed jig tied on.
I had cloudy, windy conditions. I stayed with the, I call it the Trickster 2, but it's just a Chatterbait copy that I don't sell Z-Man. And in, in, in fair to Z-Man, I like what they do. They, they make you, they, they sue you, and, and they said, I wish all companies could do that and protect stuff in this business. So I, I applaud them for the how they protect that bait. But it's basically was a, a, a Chatterbait type. I just put a little bit different hook in it. Any tournament success on on a bladed jig, when somebody just says that they're using a bladed jig and you know doesn't mention chatterbait specifically, ultimately that helps us uh, because our bladed jigs are the most widely available ones out there. Uh, they're the only ones out there um, that have that direct head to blade connection. And I think at this point, most anglers know that if you put a split ring in there between the head and the blade, it's going to kill the action. I mean, look at what's tied onto their rods. You don't see the bladed jigs with the split rings in between there. So ultimately, I think it helps us because when somebody wins a tournament on a bladed jig, whether they say it's a chatterbait or not, you know, when that person goes into Bass Pro Shops or Cabela's or Academy or their local tackle shop, usually the chatterbait brand products are what they're going to see and what they're going to buy, so it definitely helps us. The chatterbait is, is definitely um, a huge player for Z-Man. It makes up a, a large portion of our sales and you know going back five or six years ago it was probably most of our sales. Um, as we're introducing more and more products, plastics, uh, you know skirted jigs, doing a lot of jig heads, um, packaged silicone skirts, you know it's definitely uh, becoming you know a smaller piece of the pie for Z-Man but the overall quantity that we're selling is actually still increasing, which is pretty neat. I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of the different options and the different price points that we're starting to hit, um, you know, doing versions of the chatterbait that are more weedless, more snag resistant, uh, things like that. And we're constantly kind of expanding to give the consumers and the anglers what they want. Over my professional career of 11 years, I've won two Angler of the Year trophies and I've got six major tournament wins on the FLW Tour and the TTBC. And a chatterbait has played a role in at least three wins, like probably over 50% of the fish I've weighed in in those three wins were on a chatterbait. And Angler of the Year, that's you can't put a number on that because I don't go to a lake for practice or start a tournament without having a chatterbait on my deck. You know, over over my career, I would say just on a bladed jig. I mean, obviously, catching some fish on a bladed jig through through tournaments. Um, you know, I probably won uh, right around a million dollars on using a bladed jig. So uh, it's been good to me. Uh, I I love throwing it, and and obviously, um, you know. <laughs> I catch big fish doing it. So it's just a, it's a win-win. Will there ever be a bait as dominant as that that comes out in the next couple years? You know, I don't know. The only thing I could compare it to was the Alabama rig was is about as successful as the chatterbait. I mean, it was something the fish haven't seen before. And you know, I don't know if there's anything left out there to make that can do what the chatterbait did when it first got on the scene as far as the sheer numbers of fish it caught. If you think of all the companies, large and small out there, along with all the other garage inventors and tinkerers, then it's really hard in the tackle industry to come up with something that's truly unique. It's even harder to come up with something that's distinct enough to be patentable. In order to be patentable, it has to be very distinct and different from anything before it. Um, and I think that that's one thing that makes the, the chatterbait uh, and the invention and the rise of the chatterbait even that much more impressive, that it was something that's truly unique uh, and that it did create a whole new lure category. As it stands today, you've got a chatterbait which is considered a bladed swim jig at the time you got thousands of variation of crankbaits there's only one bladed swim jig there's got to be other ways
to create the same type action without infringing on the original Chatterbait patent. And that's what I've been waiting on for this, this many years. Somebody's got to do it better. And I think it could be done better or be done in a manner that would be a little bit different type action, maybe just different to where it would be an item that would be even different to the fish. I think it'd be done. That's kind of, you know, the dream of every uh, fisherman out there, every tinkerer, every lure inventor, to come up with an idea in their garage to perfect it, have guys win tournaments on it, and basically turn it into a million dollar idea. He's got some really unique um, ideas because he tries to get as far away from the normal as possible and um, there are a lot of things that are coming down the pipe with us that uh, hopefully we'll have hit the marketplace. Mm -hmm.